Um, I, I mean, Neil, I mean, when you're writing, <clears throat> what is it that, that makes a journey song? I mean, I know it's kind of a, a, a circular argument, argument. I mean, you're the guitar player in Journey. Everything you write is going to be a Journey song. But, but what really, you know, when you're writing something, how do, you, how do you sort of, you know, put a governor on it and say, yeah, that's, that's a Journey song. That's, that's yeah. going to work for us. As opposed to maybe a solo project or something. Yeah, or you know, I write a lot of stuff. And <coughs> honest to God, when I listen to what I write, a lot of, I mean, I don't go in writing thinking this is going to be for Journey or this is going to be for a solo project. I just kind of chase my ideas when I'm in a writing mode, you know, and I don't worry about where it's going to end up. I just kind of chase it for the mm -hmm. moment. I don't like to think about it too much. I kind of like just to like let it flow, whatever it is, and it's going to come out. And, you know, if it doesn't fit somewhere, it'll fit somewhere else later. Right. <laughs> so that's kind of how I go at it. And I write kind of all over the map. Some days, you know, I'll turn on, you know, a new cork synthesizer and just get some slamming, like, you know, uh, trance dance shit going, you know, hmm. and just slam some guitar on it and come back and listen to it months later. I go, wow, that's pretty cool, hmm. you know, and, and I just kind of, like, go with the flow every day, what I feel like. Mm -hmm. And um, in the end, I go back and, you know, I'll, I'll go back and I've got, you know, 25, 30, 40 ideas sitting there. And I'll just sort of organize them uh, take down notes and go, this one sounds like it could be a journey song huh. to me. Um, this one doesn't. This, you know, and sort of organize it. Wow. And, you know, and then a lot of times I just, you know, write for what we need at the moment, mm -hmm. which was kind of the case with uh, Change for the Better um, came at the last moment because after I listened to all the material that we had compiled, um, I felt like we were missing a track that had... Uh, a little more of a, an, an escape type vibe, you know, which I brought most of that music in. Interesting. Actually, all of the music. And and so I wanted to have, you know, a piece that went, it wasn't just so, like, you know, you got your hooks in it, but it's not so straight ahead generic like a lot of stuff is today. I mean, you're, there's, listen to stuff today, and it's really wild what catches out there. It's almost... The, the more simpler that it is, the more generic it's like, the verse is the chorus. Exactly. And there is no bridge. That's exactly the right. The solo. Yeah. You know, it's like the chords are the same, the groove changes up a little bit, the sounds change up a little bit, and the melody changes. Yeah. The biggest deal, though, is the same three, four, five chords mm -hmm. over and over with the same groove, and, and the melody changes from section to section. And that's sort of been what I've been hearing a lot. And I'm like, man, I understand why, you know, it's catchy and, it, and it's hooky, but I don't think it sounds like us. And I think, you know, we just stuck to our guns, and, and I think it was a smart thing to do. Interesting. So, so then, Neil, I mean, you weren't, you weren't looking to sort of create a, a modern piece like that with, you know, four changes and trying to change up melodies, because, I mean, that really is not what, what Journey does. I mean, no, I mean, it's really, I think it's, it would be like the kiss of death of any band that's been around as long as we have and sold as many records as we have and continue to sell. I mean, people are used to hearing the band for what it is and not trying to be hip and modern and, and keeping up with everybody that's young that's out there and doing something just to be hip. You know, I mean, it's obviously, there's a lot of young people buying our records, and so I think it's hip to be us. <laughs> Even if other people don't, you know, I don't really care. I'm just, like, doing what comes naturally um, for us and what people like, I think. Absolutely. I mean, Neil, you talk about change for the better. I thought that was just an unbelievable song. You know, I mean, you know, it's just, it's a great song. It was a great solo. Uh, I mean... I mean, you said that was one of the last things that came about, so, I mean, you knew maybe something was missing, uh, escape era stuff. I mean, so, I mean, these changes are coming together and the melodies are, you know, kind of getting put on it and you're thinking, Th this could be cool. I mean, this is a, this yeah, is a good like, song. You know, it was like a simple, I was using like a, a little rolling loop machine at home, one of those little loopers, you yeah. know, to write because it's very fast and easy for me. I don't have to worry about putting on a rhythm machine or if I want, there's one in there. Mm -hmm. But I, I just kind of like freelanced one day and I, I, I put down, um, 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 what's the sun shower? 
okay? And it was a stumble like lights, you know? And I wasn't really thinking about lights. It just sort of fell out of nowhere. And I didn't really have any of the pieces together. I just started jamming. And I put it in the looper. And at the end, I, li I listened to it and I go, wow, it's, it's pretty cool. And there's actually an arrangement there that is not so generic, mm -hmm. you know? It's got form, but it wasn't exactly the same. Like, every B section wasn't exactly the same. The first one wasn't the same as the second one before right. the chorus. And I went, I took it to Jonathan, and I go, I just played, I brought the loop machine, and I plugged it in, and we dumped it down in the Pro Tools, and then I hummed some melodies, and we kept the arrangement and just, you know, recorded the song. And so things come out that easy, and, and you know, John does the same thing with the ballads that he writes that he always has he just you know he's got a knack for it and he just like lays it out we listen to it and we go and record it you mm -hmm. know, it's not like you know brain surgery <laughs> right I got hey. you man I mean Neil what about a song like I mean Wildest Dream I, I mean it's a song that you actually included on the, the DVD in here I mean did you look at that as sort of maybe one of the stronger songs on the record I mean you know I, I wanted um, an up-tempo rocker even though I feel like people have not latched on to that yet, because I think um, vocally, and where the song is coming from, it is not your obvious journey song like uh, Dead or Alive wasn't on Escape. Mm -hmm, exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's one of those things that's just kind of out there, and we're noodling around trying some different things. It's got some, some cool uh, adrenaline, though. And I love the Eastern vibe of it. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole tone, half tone thing, um, you know, in in uh, the B sections. And actually, I came up with that song, um, and it came from playing the bass. Oh, really? I wrote it on the bass. Wow. And, you know, I started writing, um, I couldn't think of a cool chorus. I had the guitar chords and stuff in the front, you know, and I couldn't come up with a cool chorus, and so... I slapped on a bass and sort of wrote the bass line and, sent it and then put everything around it. Wow, interesting. That is cool. <clears throat> I mean, Neil, the solo on that song is, is really pretty great. Um, are you a, uh, what's the word, not a better guitar player, I mean, are you a more mature guitar player today than you were maybe back in the day, Neil? Are you a little more selective about what goes on tape? I mean, the, the, the sound, I mean, it's still that Neil Schoen thing, man, but it, there's a there's so much fluidity and it's just you know you know what honest to god i gotta be honest with you i think that i'm not as selective as what goes on tape anymore i think i'm playing better now than <laughs> i than i have in the past i mean a lot of people will probably argue with me you know but it, it's not necessarily it's not my actual playing if they like that they preferred something that i did earlier it was actually the songs you know and what I what I played in the song mm -hmm. itself. Interesting. And you know what was going on then. And but I think as a player, I think I'm a more fluid and uh, versatile player now than I've ever been. And you know I've been like sober now for over a year, which really you know brought a lot of other stuff up front for me. You know I mean it's just the consistency of my playing I think is is much more there every night. Wow, interesting. I, I I didn't know that. I mean, you know, Van Halen just got clean, and you know, I mean, I mean, Neil. Some part of me thinks, and I don't know if this is true about the creative spirit, but that you know, some people maybe thrive in that intoxicated state. I, I got to tell you, it's very difficult to do a lot of stuff that you come up with that's easy to come up with when you are intoxicated. Mm -hmm. The plane. The, the writing, everything, because you have to learn to turn your mind off. You know, you want to leave the brain on, but you got to turn the mind off. Uh, yeah. You start thinking, you're stinking. You know, and it's kind of like that. You know, and obviously when you're not juiced or you're not drinking or whatever you're doing, you know, you're thinking more. And so it's it's a constant effort for me just to try to don't think, just go. You know? <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, you know, and I got to tell you, it's it's uh, it's not as easy going on stage every night. You wow. know, when you're not drinking or slamming down a beer or a shot mm -hmm. or whatever. I mean, you know, I, used to, I did that for years. Mm -hmm. So did Ed. So did everybody I know. You know. Yeah. 
And so, you know, there's this sort of, uh, there was a comfort level there of, you know, just to ease the nerves, uh, forget about thinking for a second and just go and do your thing. Yeah, you yeah. Know, not that you, like, you know, you're like completely sober and stuff. It's, it's a different animal. You're a different animal to deal with. I am, you know? <laughs> Definitely. It's, it's, it's like it's a, a learning <laughs> process all over for me. Everything is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to hear it, though, man. That's, that's really terrific. Yeah, it was like either die or live. You know? Yeah, exactly. Like that, and I felt like, you know what, I'm, I don't want to be, you know, uh, ten toes up in the dirt yet. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, Neil, do you think that that was... You know, maybe, I mean, was that part of the problems between you and Steve? I mean, back in the day? I think that all that contributes to problems, yeah. And, you know, you know, we all had our problems. Definitely. And um, like every band or any human being, you know, it, people go through changes. And uh, definitely being in a band, even if you're sober, is not easy. No. You know, it's like you're married to five guys or how many people you have in a band. Um, and you're with them all the time. You got to learn to bend. You got to be democratic. You know, everybody's strong-minded. You know, I mean, you know, Steve was very strong-minded. I was very strong-minded. Everybody had their own thing that they wanted to do. And then, you know, you got to throw everything in the melting pot and, you know, make some soup in the end. <laughs> and, and, you know, so you need to, you know, you need to bend and compromise. And that's what makes, you know, I think a great band. Um, but definitely, you know, I think that, you know, drinking and drugs and all that, definitely, you know, it, it gets in the way. Mm -hmm. It makes things more difficult. Yeah. To deal with. In the end, it might, you might numb yourself, you know, which is something I did for years, you know, uh, uh, for a lot of things that I had that were bothering me in my life. I'd numb myself for years. And I just, like, put it out of my head. I'm like, oh, fuck it. Just have a drink, you know. And it would all seem like it went away, and I'd laugh my ass off, and I'd have a good time, and I'd party. But you know what? In the end, it all comes back. Mm -hmm. And if you don't deal with it straight on, it, it kind of never goes away. Definitely, unfortunately, yeah. Um, I mean, Neil, in, in a perfect world, if, if you could have brought Steve back, um, I mean, would that have been sort of the ideal of this? You know what? There's always been, all I can say, I get asked this a lot, and I keep reiterating the same thing, is that there's always been an open door for him, you know, for all these years. I mean, it wasn't like we kicked him out. He didn't choose to come with us. He didn't want to work. Hmm. Uh, even when he was having um, the issues with his hips and, and, you know, physical issues, and he wasn't ready to do operations and all that, and thought it wasn't a bad decision, we waited a really long time for him to make a decision. And while we were waiting during that duration, um, you know, we said, okay, well, if he can't tour, uh, we had offers to do songs for movies. We had, you know, had an offer, another offer to do another record for Sony. No, no, no. It was like, no, I don't want to do this. No, I don't want to. He just didn't want to do anything. And he was not interested in working with us. And so, you know, at that point, he just, you know, I, it's funny, I just did an interview with, with I was on the phone with uh, a Japanese magazine. The guy, we were kind of talking about the same thing. And, um, you know, you, I left things alone. He, you know, we went, Journey went on a hiatus for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, when we called it a day after Raised on Radio, uh, you know, we called it a day. We were in Hawaii, and that's where Steve came to us and said, you know, I can't finish this tour. I'm toast, I, don't, I, don't, I can't sing, I really feel like I need a break, and I need to just stop it all. And so we, we bailed on a mid-tour. We were like done with half of our shows that we were supposed to do. And I thought, okay, well, we'll just take a break and see what happens. Well, the break ended up being one year, two years, three years. Three years go by, and no word at all you know and so I just started getting busy man I started you know uh, working I was going to put my own band together which I should have done <laughs> way back then and, but instead I got a call from I just met, had met Dean Castronovo mm -hmm. um, he was playing with Tony McAlpine at the time I heard his drummer blazing through the walls I was rehearsing with somebody else 
working on some little project and uh, went in, met him, got his number, and I go, I'm going to start a band with this drummer. <laughs> you know, it's, for me, it's always the fireworks or the drums and the, and the guitar in the beginning. You, know, huh. you need that. And uh, then I got a call from Jonathan, and he was down in L.A. with John Waite and Ricky Phillips, and they were forming a band. And, you know, he asked me if I wanted to come audition, and I said, well, I just found this drummer that I want to start a band with. And so if you don't have a drummer, I said, maybe I can talk him into coming down with me and we can check it out. And so anyway, long story short, that's what happened. We did Bad English for two years, mm -hmm. and then that disbanded. And that was a good band. And I did a hardline project, yeah. and, and that didn't quite pan out. Then I got together with Paul Rogers, which was a gas. You know, I really loved getting back to my blues roots and playing with him for, you know, close to three years on and off and writing with him. And um, that was, you know, really a great uh, time period for me in, in playing. I was having a blast. And he was sounding so amazing. And, you know, I, I think a bit after that, I did a couple more solo records, you know, for the little indie label, Higher Octave, who is now something else. I think they're, they're not even around. Um, you know, just trying to keep myself busy. And I did the Santana uh, reunion thing called the Braxis Pool. Um, basically, everybody that was still around and alive, uh, with the exception of Carlos. Carlos didn't want to do it. And so <laughs> we did that, put out a record. Um, the band was smoking. We made a pretty good record, you know, very cheaply in my studio over in Oakland. Um, you know, at that point, you know, everybody looked at us like we had four heads, like Latin music. That was like a long time ago. They go, it sounds like Santana. We're going like, duh, yeah, God. it is. You know, with a different guitar player, you know. Um, but, and then, you know, we couldn't get arrested with that. And so I decided to move on and try to reform Journey uh, again. And um, at that point, you know, Perry had apparently contacted Jonathan said he wanted to get together and do another record and I'm thinking to myself after 10 years why you know had already gotten over all this already and sort of just moved on in my mind I was ready just to do my own thing and uh, you know but we got together we wrote a record pretty you know uh, it was like very easy and fast and and painless uh, went and recorded it the same and um put the record out trial by fire you know entered billboard charts at number three we had a number one single and then you know he had his injury and we were asked to play the grammys and he didn't want to do that and you know he didn't he said he couldn't tour and so we waited around like i said to see if he was gonna you know get his hip fixed because you know i talked to other people that had had it done before and they said you know it's not as serious as it sounds you know people are like new knee replacement and all this interrupt and walking in one month. And so he wasn't ready to do it. So we waited for close to two years and, you know, something just kind of clicked and uh, with me at that point where, you know, I hadn't been in Journey in 10 years. Then we did this record and we had all this success and he got teased with the fact of, that we were back together mm -hmm. and that it didn't happen. And I was just really frustrated, you know, sort of feeling like helpless in a helpless position and wanting to move forward with it. So, you know, we, the rest of the guys and I talked and we just decided to try to move on and and replace them, which was like a really bold move that was, you know, met with a lot of resistance everywhere that we turned. And you, and you knew that was going to happen. Well, yeah, absolutely. But you know what? I go, right now we don't have anything, mm -hmm. so there's nothing to lose. And so, you know, we um, we moved ahead and... Nine years later now, you know, a lot went on in those eight years. But yeah. Nine years later, you know, we're now playing the sold-out audiences again on this tour here. You know, we've been playing the 20,000, you know, 18 a night. Wow. And, you know, everybody's completely loving our now. And he's definitely proved himself. And he's quite the showman, an amazing singer. And this is his first major tour he's ever done, and he's definitely, you know, he's made it. <laughs> We're like over three months now without a break, and the first leg of the tour was in Europe, and it was tedious. 
you know, <laughs> a lot of shows right next to each other with not a lot of sleep, a lot of bus rides, you know, a lot of ferries and broken sleep and, you know, stuff that he was not used to at all. <laughs> and so this is kind of like he's tired. We're all tired. You know, I mean, three months is three months without a break. Mm -hmm. Next year, you know, we'll probably do, we'll do a month, take two weeks off or a week off. Another month, take another week off, you know. Um, 